One of my favorite shows that's on TV right now is a TV show called Ted Lasso. For those of you who've seen it, you've probably watched every episode of both seasons because it's one of those shows that once you get into it, you just can't stop watching it. It's funny, it's, funny, it's endearing. You learn compassionate life lessons in the midst of it all. But for those of you who haven't seen the show, Ted is this American football coach. He's from the Midwest, and he's hired to coach a European football team. That's soccer for us who live across the pond. But Ted, as I said, is an American football coach, so he has absolutely no experience whatsoever coaching soccer. So he goes to England, and he begins to try to get this band of, of soccer players together. It's a team called AFC Richmond. And what you need to know about Ted is he's kind of this folksy kind of guy. People don't really give him a chance at first. They don't really see how smart he is or what little nuggets of wisdom he has to offer. And when he first arrives, the team struggles mightily. They don't always play as a team. They have a hot shot or two that are on the field. And sometimes egos get in the way. And so you, you go through the whole first season, and when you come to that last episode of season one, AFC Richmond, Ted's team is matched against Man Manchester City. And AFC Richmond hasn't done well all season long. And so for this game, this final game, their reputation is on the line. If they lose, they will be relegated to the lower league. For those of you who don't know what that means, basically it's like going from the majors all the way down to the minors. And spoiler alert, AFC Richmond loses. And so after the game, the team is gathered in the locker room. It's very quiet. They're very sad. You can tell by their body language that they are not very happy with the outcome of the game. And, and Coach Ted, he comes in to give them this pep talk. He points out what certain players did well. He tells them, it's okay. It's okay to be sad. You're going to be sad. It's natural after a loss like this. But then he tells them, being sad is not the worst thing in the world. He says, I want you to be grateful. I want you to be grateful that you're going through this sad moment with all these other folks because I promise you, there's something worse out there than being sad. And that's being alone and being sad. Ain't nobody in this room alone. The past two years of our lives, all of our lives, we have had a lot of sadness. COVID has changed our entire way of being. We didn't get to worship together in person last Christmas Eve. We're all masked this Christmas Eve. We've had to be cautious about where we go, about who we're around. We've learned terms like rapid testing and other COVID-related terms. We're social distancing. Some people are quarantining. And the outcome has been that we've lost loved ones. Others are suffering from the long-term effects of this virus. Our healthcare system has been pushed to its limits and is continuing to be pushed to its limits. We've seen a rise in mental health care issues. We've seen a rise in drug addiction and overdoses. And that's just as a collective people. On a personal level, I'm sure different ones of us have experienced other hardships and things that have brought about sadness from job loss to health struggles that are not related to COVID. Some of you may have experienced the loss of important relationships or you're concerned about family members and loved ones. It's a struggle. It's a real struggle to see where is God in the midst of all of this? Where is God in all of this heartache and all of this grief? We live in a world where a lot of people think that either God is for us or God is against us. It's, it's this dichotomy that we live in. When good things happen, God is definitely on our side. God is definitely for us. And when bad things happen, we wonder, what did we do to deserve this? We go through our list of wrongdoings to try to figure out why these calamities are happening to us. But that's not how God works. Our world sometimes thinks that's how God works, but that's not 
how God works. God doesn't have this giant naughty or nice list that tells God, okay, these people are good and these people are bad. God doesn't sit up on some high throne and look down on people and begin to smite them for their wrongdoings. God instead chose to come to us in human flesh. God chose to come to us in this tiny child to take on our human body, to experience what we experience, to experience our our deepest joys and our greatest sorrows. That's how God came to us as a human being. Jesus' birth takes place during a time of social and political unrest. It's not all that different from what we're living in right now. And Caesar Augustus, he calls for a census to be taken so all the different people are traveling back to their, their family's birthplace so that they can take care of their civic responsibilities. It's into this world, to that world, that God comes. The world doesn't stop in the midst of it, doesn't slow down to recognize the birth of Christ. The world keeps spinning and the world keeps going. But it's into that that God comes. God enters into a world and takes on a human body. It's not the way that the Jewish people expected. It's certainly not the way that many of us would expect it to happen in this day and age. But that's how God comes. And God shows us a new way of living and a new way of being. When God enters into the world and the angels come and they, they tell the shepherds, what has happened? In verse 10, they say that this newborn child is the Messiah, the Lord. The word they use for Lord is the same one that's used in the, the ancient Hebrew scriptures. It's the same one that's used for God there, Yahweh. And so when the angels come and tell the shepherds, the Lord has come, Yahweh has come into the world, it's a big deal. It's a big surprise for them. The name given to the God who parted the Red Sea, the name given to the God who led the people out of the people of Israel out of Egypt, that same God is the one who these angels are saying has come in the form of a vulnerable, tiny little baby. That all powerful, all knowing God is now actually here with us. That all powerful, all knowing God has actually come as a human being, to be near to us, to know our joys, to know our sorrows, to know our pain. God has come to live it. God is with us, our Emmanuel. God comes into that world that is filled with sadness and unrest, and God brings a new way of living and a new way of being. It's a way of compassion and justice It's a way of love and peace. It's a way that is not of this world's standards. It's not a for us or against us. It's a with us. God is with us. God comes and lives our life. God shares our common humanity. God knows it all, for God is with us. So no matter where it is that that you find yourself this night, Whatever joy you're feeling, whatever sorrow you're feeling, whatever it is you're feeling, God is with us. Ain't nobody here alone. Let us pray. God of glory, by your grace, a child has been born for us. You gave your son for us. You came into this world for us to be with us. Authority rests upon his shoulder, and it's in Christ's name that we pray to you now. Wonderful counselor, we pray for wisdom for the world's leaders, that they may use their power to lift burdens and break the bonds of oppression. Mighty God, we pray for the church of Jesus Christ our Lord, that you will multiply and increase our joy as we share in the harvest that you have gathered. Everlasting creator, we pray for families, for friends, for loved ones, that those who now walk in deep darkness, that they may see the great light of your saving love. 
Prince of Peace, we pray for an end to violence and war, that your authority may continue to grow until there is endless peace in every land. We offer this prayer to you, Almighty God, and now we join together as we confess our sins and as we give thanks that you are a God who freely gives us your grace and your forgiveness. Merciful God, always with us, always coming, we confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We've forgotten how to hope in miracles. We've ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of this season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the Magi, the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen.